Welcome distinguished guests, panelists, and the youth. Thank you for joining us today, wherever in the world you may be located. My name is Lydia Sanzolzano. I'm 18 years old. I'm an incoming university student from Spain, but I now live in Abu Dhabi. And it is my greatest honor to be your moderator today for this new edition of the Energy Transitions Heroes by IRENA, which is also organized in partnership by the NL Foundation. And today we are focused on youth powering sustainable energy technology. We hope to share the youth's perspectives on the opportunities and solutions presented by renewable energy technology today, which has potential to not only decarbonize our energy systems, but also ensure socioeconomic progression that is fair, equitable, and promotes a sustainable future for all the generations to come. With our varied members of the panel today, we will discuss the utility of renewable energy technology, how to best maximize their potential and the way to move forward to meet our greatest climate ambitions. Because together as one united voice of youth, we can achieve the energy transition to benefit all. Therefore, to begin our webinar, I would like to start by inviting all of you to participate in a survey on Slido by using the code IRENA Youth Talk. You can go on slido.com and use the code IRENA Youth Talk. For the first question, I now invite you to select one of the following options and answer the question What is the most essential element that brings innovation to the green technological development? High degree of creativity and confidence, a solid technical background public funding for entrepreneurship and institutional activities, strengthening engagement with academia and research centers, improving awareness of existing sustainable technology programs, or being supported by entrepreneurship. We'll wait for a couple of seconds to come all the results, but as they're coming in, we can see that number one choice is either solid technical background or strengthening engagement with academia and research centers, as well as funding, which clearly demonstrates that to promote technology, we need to have greater research and awareness raising, but also funding to meet the ends of our greatest ambitions to discover more about technology and how we can use it to the best of our advantage. So as we can see, number one option being public funding, I would now like to move forward to our second question, if possible. For this question, we ask you to please use up to three words, which can be any of the ones ranging from renewable, storage, smart and digitalized grids, hydrogen, demand response, EVs, heating and cooling, but please feel free to propose any others in which you think can best describe energy technologies which might affect most on young people's lives, in your own opinion. So we can see the answers quickly coming in. We have storage, heating and cooling, renewable, sector coupling, demand response. More on renewables and storage. Energy efficiency hydrogen heating and cooling. So I think is that coming in, we can see the great variety of the different responses. And I think that demonstrates that it's only the combination of these technologies together that can really have the most impactful impact on youth's lives, but also our journey into greater sustainability and green technology with renewables. So thank you for participating in this one. It's great to see so many responses coming through. Thank you everyone for your participation in our polls. I would now like to encourage you to continue to maintain engaged in the session by proposing your own questions through the Q&A function of Zoom as we later get into the Q&A with our panelists. 
later on in the webinar. So to start our discussions today, and for our welcome remarks, I am now honored to invite Mr. Dolph Guiden, Director of IRENA Innovation and Technology Center, to give his opening words and share his own perspective on today's topic. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Lydia. It's, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, greetings from, uh, from Germany. Um, I, I wanted to start a little bit with a, with a personal reflection. Um, when I uh, started uh, uh, working uh, nearly 30 years ago, um, my first job was in climate change. So uh, and that was at the time uh, a very new topic. And, and uh, the energy research center where I started to work and, uh, and my boss said, well, you know, this is a new topic, why, why, why don't you deal with it? And it was at the time, at the time there was a COP. It must have been COP3 or something like that. And the newspaper headlines at the time was, uh, at this COP, they're gonna solve the climate problem. And here we are uh, 30 years later, and uh, the problem is, is um, emissions have probably doubled since. And, and uh, the urgency of the problem has greatly uh, increased. So not such an easy problem to solve. Um, the, uh, the, the, the attention for the topic has tremendously risen over these last three decades. So initially it was mainly an, 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 a topic of, of academic research. Um, in the last couple of years, we're getting a lot of questions from the private sector and from financing institutions. This has really become uh, uh, part of, of the, the, the whole center of, of, of debate of how do we take uh, economic development forward and sustainable development forward. And, and it has been a, a critical topic for, for human development in general. Um, energy transition is, is a key part of the solution for this climate problem. Uh, and uh, what is also clear is that uh, renewable energy, electrification, electromobility, et cetera, with even more renewable electricity and energy efficiency are the three key pillars of this, of this energy uh, transition. And that renewables uh, play such a key role is relatively new. Uh, and that mainly comes because of the tremendous technology progress and cost reduction we have seen in, uh, in recent years. And the field continues to expand rapidly. So a few years ago, we were talking about solar PV and wind. And uh, now, since, since uh, more recently, for example, green hydrogen has been added to the toolbox of, of solutions. And I'm sure new types of solutions will still come. So we, we looked at that and we think that we have the technologies that we need, but of course, a lot of these technologies are still at relatively low technology readiness level. We need to mature them further and we need also to bring down the cost further. But in principle, we have a fairly good grip on, on uh, what we need for this transition. And the main challenge now is how do we roll that out? For example, we need to triple uh, deployment of renewable power from the record levels we have seen last year in terms of capacity addition. Also, um, we, we, saw, we just saw uh, in the survey that, that um, most think that it, it's about research and, 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 and technology. And of course that is important, but what we really also need is a systemic innovation approach. So we need to work on the right markets and regulatory frameworks. We need to work on operational practices, for example, how we use power lines. And we also need new business models. So for example, uh, for aggregators or for peer-to-peer -peer, uh, trading. 
So that means we need expertise from a wide range uh, uh, of fields uh, to make this uh, transition a success. And there, of course, is a key role for you all. Energy transition is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. We see, for example, that the, the transition jobs will nearly triple between now and 2050. So there is need for uh, a lot more uh, uh, people to join uh, in, in making this transition a, a reality. We also still need to re raise awareness further. Uh, we see that what, what is in the nationally determined contributions for, for the Paris Agreement today will yield us more or less a stabilization of global emissions, but we need net zero emissions by 2050. So uh, we, we, the, 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 the rising ambitions for 2050 need to be translated into practical action for the next 10 years. This is, this is really urgent and, and that is a critical goal for this, for this year. So uh, in conclusion, uh, this is uh, an urgent problem. It is a very uh, important problem. And it's, a, in my view, a very interesting problem. And uh, you all can play a key role in solving the problem uh, going forward. That concludes my remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Island, for your insights. And speaking on behalf of youth, it's great that you see as youth is a key important asset into promoting that. As you said, it's not an easy problem to solve, but it's also one that, yes, it may pose many great challenges, but it also offers many great opportunities and solutions. And we hope that this webinar is a platform to share those going forward, to break down some of those barriers, to raise awareness, and to really push through to this journey of greater energy transition. So thank you. Now, moving forward, I would like to introduce and welcome Mr. Carlo Papa, the Managing Director at the NL Foundation, for his own words of introduction. Yes, hello everyone. I hope you can hear me well. And I thank you very much, Dolph, uh, Anupama, all the friends uh, that are here supporting this seminar. Uh, I just want to say, I mean, I, I agree 100% of the time with Dolph. This time I agree 99% because I think the energy transition is uh, for my kids who are here in the house and for you and for me, an essential element of our future. We are not at the point, I mean, uh, in May 20 years ago, maybe a well or a good horizon, a good optionality. Now it's indeed, in my humble opinion, a necessity. I mean, you are seeing the situation climate wise all over the world, and clearly energy can play an important role. So the idea to get together with uh, Irina and with you all this afternoon is to start a dialogue. Clearly, in one hour and 20 minutes, we cannot fix. Uh, one of the major problems of the planet, but we indeed can create boundaries, can create boundaries with experts, can create boundaries among us uh, to focus on, on, on two ideas. One already Dolph uh, talked about, so the role of each and every one of us, uh, despite uh, if we are techie or not techie, if we are um, expert in engineering or not, but we need to deal with technology. If we are planning a scenario or drawing a policy, we must know deeply where technology stands today and where we'll stand tomorrow. I'm not talking about science fiction. We don't need to look at necessarily at 45 years from now, but we need to know where, which is the state of the art and which is the technology that are already in the labs, ready to get started and use on the ground. And it is very important to understand the status and also to avoid bias. You know, if you are talking with your dad or your mom about changing your car into an electric cars, you run in a lot of stereotypes. And I run myself talking with my father on, on stereotypes. He think in principle, I'm crazy uh, to change my electric car, to change into electric cars. But then uh, last night, 
when I told him that my car is going to run 520 kilometers, he was kind of surprised because his bias and his knowledge brought uh, to 160 miles, uh, I mean, for the entire uh, kilometer. So, and, and this is not only my dad. When we talk about politicians and we say that uh, the 94% of the wind fleet uh, uh, the wind parks in Spain are providing ancillary service to the system. So rather than creating distortion into the system or creating balance into the system, we see a lot of face with question marks. And it's a technology that uh, I personally had the pleasure to deploy seven or nine years ago. It's not, in, not even state of the art. It's nine years ago with a little SCADA and some connection with uh, with, uh, with the national grid. So it's something doable and it's something that can be implementable. So we need to avoid this kind of bias that are on our background. We need to get together with scientists and I'm very happy we will have scientists today talk to us about the status of technology because also in looking at the technology of tomorrow, so the, the Spain issue, it's easy for me to fix. Uh, if uh, I happen to find a politician that doesn't believe uh, the wind parks can provide ancillary service. We can invite him or her to a control room in Spain of any companies uh, that is uh, using uh, wind technologies and he will see the reality. Then we can showcase that the reality is that through that, uh, the curtailment, overall curtailment of renewable has been substantially reduced. Over time, there are more renewables in the mix. And then there are the technology of tomorrow that are as important as the technology of today. And we briefly speak probably today about hydrogen. You see there is a lot of uh, you know, discussion about hydrogens, but to me, it sounds more a discussion based on ideology rather than on technology. So the, the idea of today is coming out with the hope that each of every one of us, if it's a technology, can be an evangelist towards uh, the people that are not into technology, but are willing to understand technology. If we are not technologists, we need to dig a little bit behind, you know, the first page of, uh, of for example, the cover of The Economist that um, 12, 12 years ago was saying, uh, the renewables were a Cinderella option that would never happen. Guess what? The company I'm serving now is worth more than uh, many oil and gas companies, especially because we bet on renewables. So get together with scientists, or if we know about science, uh, diffuse our science it would be the best effort we can do. I mean, the best endeavor we can take to ensure our future. I hope you will enjoy the discussion today. I'm very pleased if we can connect going forward because, I mean, if we put together as our brain, our efforts, we may win this um, challenging battle by working as a team. And I know I may sound too Italian now because Italian won the football game, but it's really, I mean, uh, the team playing is something that can help us in winning the, the energy transition and guaranteeing sustainable development to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Papa, for your words and your insight. And you know, you've mentioned that the energy transition is no longer this idea going forward. It's an essential element. It's a necessity that we need to put forward and it needs to be that collaboration between different entities and different like-minded people that can really bring that innovation that we need going forward. And as the youth, we really welcome your remarks to work together in the future because it's truly that partnership going forth and that determination together that can really mark the change that we want to see. Therefore, moving on to our youth debate, I would now like to start our icebreaking sessions by firstly introducing Dr. Anupama Sen, the Executive Director at the Oxford Institute of Energy Studies to give her own insight on the energy transition based on her own experience and research background. Thank you very much, Lydia, and hello, everyone. It's uh, really a great pleasure to be with you today. Uh, so I'm a researcher at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies here in Oxford in the UK, where we focus on studying the energy transition in partnership with organizations such as NL Foundation. And the majority of my career has been in research and academia. I currently co-direct the Electricity Research Program here at the Institute, and I'm an economist by training. Um, in my research, and I, would, I should say in our research, we tend to think a lot about 
how to drive the energy transition, what drives it, how to make it go faster, are there lessons from past transitions? And so although this is a forward-looking forum and we've been talking about current challenges and future opportunities, I'd actually like to just briefly refer back to uh, the very first energy transition, a period of history in the late 16th century, which was the beginning of the transition away from wood towards using other types of energy such as coal. And that period of change has been referred to by a lot of historians as the domestic revolution. A reason being because it began in people's households, in people's day-to-day -day domestic lives. It was first documented as happening in cities, this switch to coal, uh, such as London, for instance. And then this change slowly spread across countries and economic systems over the course of the next two centuries. And then finally, it resulted in this period of time known as the Industrial Revolution, where we know that coal became the main energy source that was used uh, in driving economies around the world. So the, the, the point of this is that the story of the beginnings of this very first energy transition and the early rise of coal was about individual and household choices relating to people's domestic needs. So people began adopting coal in their households as an alternative to wood for reasons relating to convenience, because they could free up their land, which they used to previously grow wood and other vegetation for fuel or to grow other crops on it. But this transition was not just a switch from one fuel to another. It also brought about widespread changes in domestic lifestyles. So running a coal-fired home was very radically different to running a wood-fired home. It had a pervasive impact on everything, on heating, on the domestic architecture of people's homes, uh, on furniture that they used, on the way they cooked things, on their diet, on their cleaning practices, and a number of other things. So the reason I refer to it is because it reminds me very much of the fact that in the present day, this generation and your generation is on the brink of a similar magnitude of changes that will be driven by people's choices around consumption, supported by an entire ecosystem of renewable energy technologies in which electricity will be the main vector. Now, I'm a researcher and I focus on studying the economics of energy. And when I began my research career around 15 years ago, our research focus was on how energy and electricity supply could better match demand, how electricity was produced, how it was traded and how it was consumed. And over time, as we began studying more in depth questions around how to decarbonize the energy sector, the questions changed to how can we get people as consumers to exercise choices in the type of energy that they use and by extension in the types of goods and services that they choose to consume in a more sustainable way. So in the last few years, we've seen a few key trends emerging that will shape the future. For instance, the energy system as we know it is gradually turning upside down. We're going from a system where supply is changed to meet demand to one where demand will change to match available supply based on the adoption of decentralized renewable energy like rooftop solar by people in their houses, for instance. The electricity networks that supply energy to people will change from simply being passive carriers of energy to smart grids, helping people to make efficient and affordable choices around energy consumption. And all of this will drive and be driven by changes in the way that we live. So in our heating, in our cooling, the architecture of our cities and our buildings and so on. And if we look at what happened in that very first energy transition that I referred to back in the 16th century, it has the potential to result in a magnitude of change in our economic system, making it more decentralized, more circular, and hopefully more sustainable. And in this change, citizens and people are the drivers and the main beneficiaries. And so they should be involved through proactively making choices around everyday living to catalyze wider change. Um, and so this is these are the kinds of problems that we focus on studying at the moment. How do we get people to change the way that they consume goods and services to make decisions and sustainable decisions around the kinds of energy that they use in day-to-day -day life. Uh, the transition to renewable and decarbonized energy is really an opportunity to change a system and make it more sustainable through exercising our choices as consumers, beginning with, but just not limited to switching from one energy source to another. There is tremendous room for innovation in this space. So for ideas around how the way we consume goods and services, including energy, can be made more sustainable, 
for developing measures and metrics that can help us understand and track changes that are environmentally sustainable and that can be adopted on a global scale. So there is a lot of work to be done in the research space in these areas. And indeed, they are almost the next frontier of research for us as energy researchers. So in conclusion, and in the context of the transition to a decarbonized energy system driven by electrification, um, I very much encourage you to continue driving this mindset of change as you make choices not just around your future or the careers that you wish to pursue, but also in your everyday lives, because the history of past energy transitions shows us that indeed those choices are the early catalysts of bringing about widespread change. So with that, I'll end my remarks and back to you, Lydia. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Sen, for your regards today. It's great to see how we are on track and you know you've mentioned these small changes as being a catalyst to something greater and I think that clearly demonstrates the hope of the energy transition and the fact that it lands on consumers making those rational choices and slowly making a change and I think that you know it demonstrates that yes it's going to be something hard it's going to be something difficult to change but de indefinitely it's up to us to make the change and I think that shows a really bright future and hope because all of us believe in that making a difference. And if we all work together and do those minor changes, we can have a big colossal impact as you've mentioned. Therefore, for our next icebreaking speech, I am now delighted to introduce Mr. Nicola Armaroli, the research director and member of the National Research Council at CNR to provide his own message on renewable energy. Sorry, would you be able to unmute yourself? Yes, here it is, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Lydia, for your introduction. I am very glad to be here, and I thank the IRENA and Daniel Foundation for this invitation. Uh, mm, we know that the world is at the crossroads now, and climate change is already here, and time is running short to change our, our path. Uh, the tipping points beyond which we could have irreversible changes to the, to the biosphere might be closer than expected. So we have to, to rush. Let me say it chemically. What, what are we going to do? We, are, we must stop the largest uncontrolled chemical experiment ever made, which is the release of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This is a chemical experiment that we have to stop. Well, in this complex scenario, because it is not easy to stop these emissions, because we have been doing this for centuries in extensively, and uh, our energy system is, is consolidated, so it has a big inertia to be changed. But in this complex scenario, we have at least, uh, I would say, two good news and two bad news. The good news, number one, is that uh, the we know that the solution primarily rests on a radical change of the world energy system. So this is our primary goal. We know what we have to do first, change the world energy system. Um, we may have disagreement about different opinions, about the solutions, about technologies, about details, but finally everyone agrees that we have to stop uh, um, the uh, carbon dioxide emission and change the, the energy system. I tell you uh, as, as youngsters that this was not guaranteed up to let's say five years ago. Not one was convinced about that. Now finally, and it is a, a good step forward, everyone I would say is convinced that we have to change. That's good news. The good news number two is that uh, humankind as already pointed out, pointed out by uh, Anupama is, uh, has been in, in energy transition for centuries. So there is nothing new under the sun in a way. So we are familiar with energy transitions. Let's go to the bad news because we have to be realistic. The previous energy transition, if you look at, 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 the, at the trends, lasted approximately 100 years. The one, for example, from, 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 from coal to oil uh, lasted uh, one century. But for the present energy transition, we have only 30 years. We know that we have to reach the climate neutrality by mid-century, and it's a terrific challenge. The bad news uh, number two is uh, that the uh, ongoing energy transition will have to take place in a globalized and interconnected world, which is on one hand a good news, a 
But on the other hand, it's more complicated. It's more very complicated. And uh, now we are eight billion people on this planet. We are going to be maybe 9.5 or 10 billion by mid-century when we have to complete our our uh, transition. In uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, there were much less people, only two billion people, and so it was in a way, in principle, easier to do that. Moreover, climate change is already occurring, so we have to make it in a climate uh, constrained situation, let's say. And overall, in this context, we have also an increasing pressure on the Earth's natural resources. I will come back to this point later. So now we need solutions. And it is very important that we distinguish between solutions that are available now already and solutions that we can be implemented in 10 years or maybe 20 or 30 years. Let me uh, tell you very frankly, uh, because that, that's very important, my opinion is that at least 90% of the technical solutions are already available. They can be improved, much more improved, but they are already there. So generally, we don't need miracle technologies now. We, we, we can start already with what we have, which is very good news in a way. Let me take two examples. If you consider light duty vehicles, uh, particularly cars, the electric uh, car is already there, you can buy it. And there are an increasing number of models and the, the market penetration is increasing and, and the batteries also are increasing, are, are improving in terms, of, in terms of performance and cost even is decreasing. The other uh, domain is heating. In the heating sector, we have to phase out combustion as soon as possible because this is a big sector producing a lot of, of carbon dioxide emission. And we have the solution already because we can use heat pumps and they are uh, powered by electricity and the electricity can be renewable. As we know, the renewable electricity is already here. So heat pumps are available, you can buy it. Uh, they are highly, highly efficient. And importantly, they provide both heating and cooling. So you have one machine and you simplify your, your system at home or in your uh, company or in your office. Well, put it very simply, it has been already pointed out before, we must electrify as much as possible final uses. And uh, light duty vehicles and uh, heating are the first, the first candidate. Then we have what we, we can do after 2030. And one just due to time constraint i can just only mention one option which is green hydrogen already mentioned by carlo and uh, as you know green hydrogen is made from water and renewable electricity and uh, well unfortunately it is often presented as an option already available uh, unfortunately this is not the case i mean uh, green hydrogen at present apart from market consideration from cost it is technologically not available there are not huge production of this of this um, um, energy vector. And we never have to forget that it is very energy intensive to produce hydrogen. You, you need 50 kilowatt hour of electricity for every single kilogram of, of hydrogen. So it cannot be used because it is so valuable for any applications as some people say nowadays. Uh, where there are alternatives, don't use it. In, in, for example, the typical example, the electric car is three to five times more efficient than the hydrogen car. So why to use hydrogen for cars? And the same is also uh, true for, for heating. So we have to concentrate the production of, of green hydrogen in the future, not now, because now it's not readily available, to heavy duty vehicles and uh, hard to abate sectors like steel, cement, and so on. Another point that I wanted to highlight is that we have bottlenecks for the transition. In my books and my papers, I, I, I describe several of them. I have just time to mention one, which are natural resources. Renewable energy fluxes are, most of them are sun powered like biomass, wind, water, and of course, so, uh, sunlight. They can cover our energy demand many times over. So it is not a problem of the energy uh, flux, of the energy availability. But this is not enough to solve the energy transition because solar energy fluxes, all of them, direct and indirect, must be harvested and stored in usable forms. So you need to make at the very end electricity or you need to make fuels starting from, from uh, sunlight. 
So you need devices to do that, which are made from mineral resources. Uh, they are not coming from the sky like, like sunlight. They are, they are in the earth, they are in our planet and they are limited. And we need strong international cooperation for a shared and fair use of mineral resources. This is very important at the international level. And I hope that IRENA will, will, will push on this. And as far as resources are concerned, uh, the new energy system in a way is similar to the old one. Probably this is the only aspect where the new energy system that we are targeting is similar to the old energy system based on fossils. We have only one planet and we will continue to dig. I mean, in the fossil fuel era, we dig for coal, for hydrocarbons. In the renewable energy world, we will dig for uh, minerals to make the converters and the accumulators. So we still rely on, a, on one planet and we have always be aware that we have only one spaceship Earth. We, we cannot go anywhere else to, uh, to recover mineral resources. Then, uh, as a scientist, I am a chemist and I work in the, in the solar energy conversion uh, domain. What are the research perspectives nowadays in the field of, of energy uh, conversion and energy transition? I can uh, indicate a few lines of, of, of hot research in, in, in the field, and, uh, but there are many others. The first one is definitely batteries. We need to expand the technology portfolio be, be, beyond lithium ion batteries. We need to expand the use of flow batteries, for example, which is another electrochemical technology. Another point for sure is the electric grids. We have to make it more powerful and also more resilient because we will have more extreme weather events and we have, uh, we have to consider that. We have also an increasing risk of cyber attacks. So we need a stronger uh, grid and uh, we need it smarter because it has to manage an increasing number of prosumers like me, which produce their electricity from the, the uh, on the roof or, 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 or with other meters. Another technology that has to be developed substantially is electrolyzers. Electrolyzers nowadays to make green hydrogen are not very tolerant towards fluctuating uh, uh, electricity input and, and improvement in the technology has to be made. That's why I say that we will make it in, in 2030 because uh, they are not ready now uh, to work extensively. Full cell is another domain. And also, let me tell this, the direct conversion of sunlight into fuels. This is the domain of, of my research by photoelectrochemical processes. And you need a, a lot of, of materials for, for doing that. So let me conclude with the perspectives for your generation. First of all, never forget as the youngsters that the energy transition is not only about science and technology. I think this as a scientist, but I think it is very important. The energy transition is about a radical change of the world and the society as a whole. And we need a wide range of, prof of professionals to make it possible. Of course, we need chemists, engineers, physicists, biologists, this is obvious, but we need much more, much more. We need, for example, to redesign cities. So we need architects, for instance. We need to find the new financial instruments uh, to support the transition. We need to embrace a new circular economy paradigm. So we need economists. We need to change the legislative framework. So we need legislators with a wide background, technical background. We need to teach the energy transition at the every all levels in schools from kindergartens to university. We need teachers. Uh, we need also uh, to communicate the energy transition to, to, to people around the world. So we need journalists, we, we need media professionals, which can distinguish between credible solutions and greenwashing. That's, that's important. And my final message is this one. After uh, over 5,000 years, uh, after the, the, the establishment of the first uh, embryos of cities in Mesopotamia, uh, now we are, uh, during this period of time, there were uh, tens hundreds of generations, okay? They followed one another across time. Very few of them, approximately four of them, enjoyed in only some regions of the world, not everywhere, a dramatic increase in the quality of life due to the un unprecedented amount of energy made available to them. Now there is one generation, and it is your very generation that happens to be here right now, 
and needs uh, to radically change this energy system because it is incompatible with the stability of, of our uh, biosphere. And you have to do it and you have to find the solution and you have to also make energy available and affordable to everyone on the planet, not only to privileged people, while preserving the stability of our beautiful, fantastic planet. So you may have many challenges and opportunity, but you have also a huge responsibility. But let me tell you that you have also the possibility that in the future, history will remember you as the generation who literally saved the human civilization from self-destruction. And they trust that you will be up to this role. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for your extensive um, discussion there. I think, you know, towards the end, you were mentioning everyone that needs to be involved, teachers, economists, journalists, I could go on. And I think that truly shows that it needs to be an inclusive energy transition and it needs to involve all of us. And I just wanted to say thank you. We feel really honored that you say that you have confidence in placing your trust on us, that we are going to lead this change. But we're also thankful for you, for all the research, all the experiences that you're sharing today, because they are the source of inspiration that we have to keep going forward. And so to move on, I would now like to start the debate session in which I would like to firstly introduce our very first speaker, which is Rind al Haq, the focal point for VRE grid integration at the SDG7 youth constituency. So Rind, based on your academic research experience with renewable energy, can you reflect on the importance of youth involvement in renewable technology? For example, what youth bring to the energy transition and how we can really maximize their positive influence there. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for your question, Lydia. Thank you also, everyone, for your great interventions. I'm sure that some of the points that you mentioned will come up often in the debate. So as you might have mentioned, I have a research-oriented academic background. So I'm an energy engineer, and I'm soon starting a PhD. But right now, I need to be a bit more artistic than scientific. I want you all to paint a portrait that you will keep in the back of your minds for the end of the talk. This is the picture that I want you all to visualize. Youth as researchers. We have three things, curiosity, diligence, and vision. I hope that the other interventions, uh, that the other speakers from the research field can agree with me, but I believe that those are ingredients that can help us create ideal researchers. There are also some of the reasons why youth and research are a great combination. Young women and men in energy are explorers. So we all think of youth as this uh, journey of self and external discovery, but in this phase, we also have an eagerness to check upon the knowledge that we already have, to do some fact checking, to question, to, to answer all of these things that we were always wanted to learn. So I think research is one of the most ideal environments where you can ask all these questions, you can try to get answers, maybe you will fail, maybe you will succeed, but you will definitely enjoy the journey. Second thing we all have to remember is that most of the technologies that we use today in renewable energy probably started as an internship experiment or a PhD subject for a student somewhere. And some of them even wound up being the prototype that young researchers turned entrepreneurs used for their startups. So either the ideas can be brought by youth or they can be ideas that are already out there in the research field that young people come and test and put forward. The second quality that I spoke about is diligence. And I know that rigor is something that we learn day by day by cooperating with experienced researchers like the ones that we had in the introduction. So rigor is something that's very essential so we can formalize this curiosity. But the word that I mentioned was diligence, because diligence also means hard work, which youth aren't short of. So the least we can do, and my personal recommendation is to ensure that young people have those opportunities, that they have PhD scholarships, 
adequately paid internships so they can both grow and cultivate their field. And finally, the question we should always ask is what for? Uh, why is my research useful? How does it bring value to the energy transition? How does it drive it forward? You mentioned this in the beginning of the talk. What solution can it unlock? So this definitely resonates with the search for purpose that all young people have at this stage of their lives. But vision isn't just a synonym of looking forward. What makes young researchers explorers and not just adventurers is actually looking back. So young people acknowledge the importance of actually going back and telling the, their tale, telling what they learned in a language that anyone can understand. So we, we've had some interventions at the beginning with Carlo Papa saying that we need to understand technology. And then right now, just before, we said that the energy transition isn't about science and technology, it's about everyone. It isn't a subject that should be studied alone. It's something that should be integrated in every discipline. So what's amazing about young people is that they are launching initiatives. They are launching initiatives like science popularization, like blogs and videos, so that the energy transition and all these technical details goes from something that's linked to an expert technical discussion to an issue that we all grasp and fight together in the combat against climate change. So if I want to quickly wrap up the message I'm hoping to send today is that youth and renewable energy are curious, diligent, and visionary. So the next time you picture a world that, as you stated, drives the energy transition forwards, picture youth as researchers. Thank you. Thank you, Rind. I think one word that really sticks out to me from what you said is accessibility, is making not only youth be more accessible to being educated and being the accessible to those programs and receiving funding, but also making that learning accessible to everyone so that everyone can understand the importance. It can be simple using blogs, videos. And I think youth are at the center of that. And we recognize that it's something difficult, but if we break it down, we can really make that energy transition more accessible, which I think is a great thing moving forward. So now I would like to introduce Kabir Narakin, who is the Climate Finance Advancer at the Student Energy to provide his own remarks on the importance of a youth-led technological advance. Kabir, what are the greatest obstacles presented within our energy ambitions and how can they best be overcome by youth, the private sector and governmental institutions, for example? Thanks, Lydia. Um, so before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Salvatooth nations um, in Vancouver, Canada. Um, I'd like to thank them for having cared for this land and water for time beyond our uh, acknowledgement. And I look forward, and Student Energy looks forward to continuing to work with them um, as we work towards a future of, of energy. Um, so at Student Energy, we are a global nonprofit um, that empowers young people, a network of 50,000 people around the world um, to uh, accelerate the transition towards a sustainable and equitable energy future. Um, we've been working with this network uh, from uh, of over 50,000 youth uh, from over 120 countries um, to build the knowledge, skills, and networks that they need to take action on, on climate as well as, as on energy. Um, and within our 12 years, um, we have found that young people, especially I think this past year uh, and the year before with the youth climate strikes, uh, we noticed that young people have been more um, activated within this space and more passionate about kind of helping resolve climate um, and, and fix, fix problems and become part of the solution. Um, they become more passionate about this than ever before. Um, however, we also found in a lot of surveys that 74% of youth have still indicated that despite being really passionate about climate, they don't really know what specifically they can do. Um, and, and we're not talking about kind of personal actions, we're talking about, you know, systemic leadership and systemic change. Um, and a lot of people still don't really know how they fit into this big picture um, of, of the energy transition. 
Um, and beyond this, within our Global Youth Energy Outlook, we also found that 50% um, of youth who we surveyed um, have said that this was actually the first time they've ever even been asked their opinion on what energy and climate means. And, and so this means that a lot of young people who have voices um, and who, ha who have a major stake, I think, in the future of energy um, are not even being consulted in the first place. So I think that's the first step uh, in terms of what governments and what energy companies and so on can do is just ask young people what they think. Um, because this is not only going to, you know, um, help empower these young people, but it's also going to help governments and companies make sure that they're resilient towards kind of these future changes of, of public opinion. Um, beyond this, I think, um, you know, beyond kind of providing opinion and, and being involved in decision making, um, young people are also, especially within our network, we're finding that a lot of young people will go through the student energy programs, they will start a chapter, they will become a leaders fellow, um, et cetera, and they'll come out of this with an incredible idea for a new business, for instance, uh, that is very locally oriented. Um, so for instance, we have certain alumni who have started really interesting um, and, and really innovative waste to energy solutions within their own communities. They have created 40 full-time jobs, um, et cetera. But then we're also finding that a lot of young people within our network, as well as beyond, um, are having a really hard time finding the resources and mentorship to actually become entrepreneurs. Um, and so 82% of global entrepreneurs, um, especially within the youth category and especially within the global south, um, indicate that financial support is one of the biggest barriers um, to becoming an entrepreneur. And, and we think at Student Energy that as the future of energy becomes more decentralized um, and, and people around the world are gaining access to energy, um, having access to these financial resources can actually make a really big difference in uh, uh, tackling not only climate change, but also energy access and climate resilience. Um, and so that's another thing that Student Energy is working towards um, to kind of help bridge that financial gap. Um, and, and of course, I think the training and, and so on of our programs goes, goes with that. Um, and then another topic that I really wanted to talk on, I think um, one of the panelists earlier uh, mentioned bottlenecks in the energy transition. Um, and that's a really interesting topic. I think oftentimes within the energy space, because a lot of us are engineers and a lot of us come from um, kind of this technical background, um, we tend to focus on the material limitations, uh, whether it's, you know, how will our grids adapt to uh, kind of vari variable sources of energy or, you know, how will we find uh, the materials that are needed to build all of these wind turbines and solar panels. But we don't think about the social barriers and the social bottlenecks. Um, and at Student Energy, I think one thing that we um, are really paying a lot of attention to is the, the human resource and the talent bottleneck of the energy transition. Um, so in a recent survey of HR managers within the energy industry, um, we found that 65% of HR managers were actually really concerned about the availability of skilled young people. Um, and, and so, you know, current educational programs, um, I know as a recent graduate, who is really passionate about energy, I found that my university, you know, wasn't really offering programming that was, um, you know, really tailored and up to date with the pace of the energy transition. It was still kind of teaching more so um, fossil fuel related uh, programming as opposed to clean energy programming. And I think that's the case with a lot of young people around the world, just access to up to date and future oriented curriculum is, is not really available. And so that's another gap that student energy through our programming and, and through our experiential learning opportunities is really trying to fill. Um, and yeah, so in, in terms of what governments, what energy companies, et cetera, can do, um, student energy's recently launched um, our solutions movement, which is our most ambitious pro program or project to date. Um, and the goal of that, uh, of this movement is to mobilize $150 million by 2030 in order to fund, support, as well as deploy 10,000 youth-led projects um, globally. Um, and, and so to begin this, we're aiming to raise $10 million in 2021. Um, we've already gained some really strong partnerships. Uh, we have submitted um, a formal youth energy compact through um, the UN Energy, um, and, and we've already started working with great uh, stakeholders, such as the government of Denmark, uh, as well as a partner, New Energy Nexus. 
um, to kind of create the startup incubator um, uh, at Student Energy. And so um, if anyone wants to join and, and kind of help empower youth to become these systemic change makers, please, please, uh, let's connect. Perfect. Thank you, Kabir, for outlining all the solutions. And I think one question that really stands out is that youth are so passionate about what we want to do. We're passionate about our environment. But the key question is, what can we do? What can the individual do? And I think every little links into what Dr. Sam was talking about is that the individual actions is that what's going to spark the greater changes that we really do need in our society. So moving forward for our final speaker of today, I would like to introduce Ujumwa Ojemi, who's the Development Finance Executive of Open Africa Power Alumna. So Ujumwa, would you be able to elaborate on the role played by the youth and women in promoting renewable energy technology for this energy transition? Thank you very much. And um, it's been great to hear from other experts in the field. Um, they have very passionate contributions on this subject. Um, I think the subject around energy transition has been well covered and it's very clear that um, there's a lot of work to be done, um, ranging from carbon capture to energy storage to even aviation, given the growing population. But we know clearly that today the workforce and the energy sector um, has a lot of intersectional equity concerns to where it concerns youth and women. Um, today, we, all, we know that um, globally, the young people are rising to the form of advocates and innovators um, when it comes to clean energy. But unfortunately, um, we're not well represented, um, even though we're a large part of the population today. And so it's very important for the representation um, across board to improve. Specifically around about women, um, although the renewable energy sector is doing better in terms of um, having about 32% of the sector um, the sector's workforce being female and being women, there's still a lot of work to be done um, to ensure that women are not just seen as a special group in the industry, um, but women are mainstream users and even producers of energy and should be a part of the energy transition. Um, I'll speak a bit more around um, what the role that youth play, just to contribute to what everyone has said. Um, today, we know that, for instance, with decentralized energy solutions, um, this is providing a lot of opportunities for young entrepreneurs across the value chain, whether it's mini grids, standalone systems, and even in processing solar, solar mills and, and irrigation pumps and things like that. And according to a research by Power for All, we understand that um, this decentralized renewable energy sector has the potential to create up to five times more jobs in local communities. So I think it's really important um, that we consider young people and the opportunities that the energy transition as well as renewable energy provides young people. Across the world, we see what the young people are doing. So for instance, in Bangladesh, we have solar share um, that provides a platform for trading um, energy, electricity. In Rwanda, we have Arad Group who is providing kiosks that sells power as well as um, telecom services. And even in Nigeria, we have one watt solar that has just raised the green bond um, to improve access to energy um, in the country. So it's very important and we can see that there's evidence that when young people are provided with the required training and opportunities, um, they're doing and they're making great um, progress to help us to transition better. Um, when it comes to women as well, some people ask, do women really need renewable energy? And I think the evidence is very clear that women need renewable energy. Um, starting from even cooking at home and the time spent in collecting firewood and things like that. We know that women um, face a lot of um, challenges, whether it's health or safety challenges. So that's one aspect. But we also know that um, for micro enterprises and which improves livelihoods and incomes, um, women are at the forefront of having small businesses um, and they are doing better when they have energy solutions for vegetable drying, for fish smoking or for even just cooking or whatever it is. So it's clear that women um, need renewable energy. But the other question that people ask is, um, are women actually interested in renewable energy? Um, are they capable? Can they, do they have what it takes? I think it's very clear and evidence again shows um, even from, from very early indigenous days that women um, have found ways of using technology for the most mundane tasks. 
And so I think the question is, how can we take the knowledge they have and what they need into consideration when we're coming up with these solutions and um, technology solutions? Secondly, I would say that women especially are now um, being more represented, even within the energy sector, whether as policy makers, um, even as entrepreneurs, as regulators and across the value chain. So it's very important that women are, continue to be represented and continue to provide the diversity um, that is required to, to, to scale and to, to transition better. Women are playing their role as extension workers, as lobbyists across board, across the value chain. Um, but the last question that people ask is, okay, so would women auto automatically benefit from these technologies and how does it work? And I think the question is, no, it needs to be intentional. So women need to be consulted, they need to be at the table um, at every point in time, whether it's when the policies are being developed or when the solutions are being crafted, when the R&D is being done, what women need um, and how can women contribute and participate. Um, because one example that has been given is that sometimes women, when there's mechanization of some processes, because women sometimes don't have the credit required or the training or one thing or the other, they don't benefit from the solution because bigger producers or bigger people that are already well established then take advantage of it. So it, it, it means that we need to now think of what the solutions are. For youth, I, 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 I don't have much to say other than what has been said. Um, youth need to be consulted, trained, educated. Their networks need to be supported. And I'm very glad to see the work that Student Energy is doing. Um, clearly, the young people need to be at the global decision-making tables. And I'm glad that um, various organizations like ARENA, Sustainable Energy for All, um, they're doing what they need to do around that. Um, when it comes to women, two things I would say is that we need to document um, more to show the evidence um, around when women are involved and when women are consulted. What is the evidence? We need to have more documentation around that. I believe that this will be helpful for policymakers as well as financiers. So we need to do more around documentation. And if there are grants available um, to support that, I believe that that would be very important um, to make a difference going forward. The second thing I would say is that we need to look beyond just um, providing technology um, to women. We need to look at the entire ecosystem. Do they have access to credits? Do they have access to the land they need? And um, what is the cultural context and how can it be improved? And things like that. We need to not just solve one solution, which is technology. We need to look across the value chain. So in a nutshell, I would say that um, three things. We need to consult with women and youth. We need to collaborate with them. And we need to support them, whether it's trainings, resources, mentorship opportunities. And one example I will give is the Open Africa Power Program by NL Foundation, which I've been um, opportune to be a part of. Um, so that program has provided me with a network, training, resources, opportunities, even the opportunity to be speaking um, in this session now. So I think it's important that we encourage more of such pro programs for the young people to participate, to exchange knowledge across um, Africa and even across the globe. And then finally, um, the African Women in Energy Development Initiative, which is an initiative that I founded with um, another woman in energy to help to mentor, support women in the energy sector. I think we just need to do those three things, consult, collaborate, and support each other as we transition. Thank you. Thank you, Ujumwa, so much for contributing today. I think those three words are really going to resonate all throughout this webinar. And something that you mentioned is that women need renewable energy, but renewable energy also needs women. So I think it's that balance of, you know, that we need a, t um, a place at the table, youth, women, we need to be inclusive of everyone, of whether race, gender, but also, as we've said previously, their own perspective ideas and the jobs that they have can be truly changing and bringing different perspectives to the table. Moving on now, I would like to start our Q&A session with the audience. Um, thank you everyone who has been participating so actively today in submitting your questions. You are definitely helping to raise the voice of youth. And today our discussions are a product of the hope and determination to make a change. For our first question, I would like to give the floor to Adej Aditoyi to ask your question. You have the floor. Yeah, many thanks, Lydia. Um, my question goes thus: being, as being said today, uh, transition is quite a very important. How do we as youth facilitate finance towards purposeful energy transition? These have been the main key hindrances, most especially in global south and especially in Nigeria. 
that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. So a question on how are we going to actually facilitate the funding necessary? Um, if we have any volunteers to answer that question, that would be great. I will hand over now to Kabir, the floor is yours. Yeah, um, so one thing at Student Energy that we're finding is that a lot of young people, okay, so right now there is some funding available, right, within, within climate finance. And um, what we're finding is a lot of that funding is actually accessible in um, certain parts of the world, um, which, you know, that, that, that makes it inequitable. And another part of it that makes it really inequitable from a youth perspective is that a lot of young people don't know or probably won't really have a need to manage, you know, a million dollar or even like a $500,000 grant. You know, young people who are starting off on their first venture or starting off on their first company will probably need a seed funding amount of let's say $10,000 or $50,000. And a lot of um, climate financiers, whether these are um, major banks or uh, foundations, et cetera, don't actually know how to manage check sizes that are that small. And so that's why I think student energy and organizations that are youth led like student energy can play a really big role in working kind of between young people um, who, you know, require kind of not only this funding, but also training um, and, and these kind of larger climate financiers who, you know, don't necessarily know how to um, dole out kind of check sizes in such smaller amounts, but can probably play, play a really big role in, in funding them um, in different ways. Um, thank you, Kabir. Um, Ujumwa, the floor is yours if you would like to make some additional comments for that. Yes, um, I'd just like to add two things to, to what has been said. Um, the first would be really for financiers or investors. Um, I think it's important understanding that the young people um, are young and so don't necessarily have um, a track record of running businesses or experience, um, so much experience. I think that the financiers, they need to look within networks that already exist that these young people belong to, and one of which could be student energy. So where you see what their, their experience has been there, what behavior, what character they've shown, and how, how reliable they've been. You might not have the typical um, experience of maybe having three years bank statements to show that you've been running a business or, or things like that. So I think it's important for financiers to be flexible around what you're asking the youth for. But for the young people, I'll ask them to look locally, um, look around you. Sometimes you don't need to go very far. You can start with family and friends, but I think also there are some grant programs um, around um, like the USADF that helps um, for innovative projects. Um, and, and the second thing I'll say to young people would be, from wherever you start, just be very um, transparent. So keep your records very carefully. Um, even if you're just starting today, just make sure that you're very transparent in what you do. Keep your records. People, people are investing in your team and not necessarily in a solution that has already been developed. So it's very important to have that transparency upfront. Thank you, Ojumo, for your comments. I would like to hand over to Dr. Sen if you would like to add anything to this question. Yeah, thank you, Adetechi. I think that's an excellent question. I just wanted to uh, I just wanted to add one uh, high level sort of comment to that, which is there's no there's a lot of agreement around the fact that the whole world needs to transition. There's less agreement about who needs to pay for that, and then you get issues around the energy transition, justice, and so forth. So I think at a global level, there needs to be some sort of consensus around global mechanisms which ensure that these funds which are needed go to the countries that need them essentially. And whether that's done through a, you know, a global carbon tax or some sort of tax and the revenues from that are then recycled back into enabling the transition through these more micro level initiatives, there needs to be some more discussion and debate around that. And I think that's one of the sort of key areas where forums like this should also you know, raise this issue. Thank you, Dr. Sen and everyone who has answered that question. And thank you, Adish, for proposing that one as well. For our second question, I would now like to invite Matthias Kirsner. You have the floor. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> and my question was um, mainly addressing a topic that I came um, um, I came about in a, one of the projects that I was doing in my um, master program, and it was mainly addressing the topic of decarbonization. Um, of the industrial sector 
Um, so in, in this um, <clears throat> international also, um, from an international point of view, where uh, products like uh, steel cement are being traded uh, in different uh, countries and different regions. So how, um, or what's your opinion actually on, on where, when products are being um, produced and uh, sold in uh, economies where uh, an animation trading system, for example, is in place uh, or emission reduction policies are in place. Um, um, in, um, uh, compared to the products that are produced in, in other regions where these policies are, are not in place and make the products maybe uh, more competitive from, from an economic point of view. Uh, thank you, Matthias. I would like, like to hand over to Dr. Sen to answer. Yeah, thanks, Matthias. It's a great question. And it's a lot, it is a question that we look at quite frequently in our research. I think even Nicola referred to it when he mentioned something called Spaceship Earth. Uh, how do we get to a situation where there's an equilibrium, where the, the amount of goods and services that you're producing don't go on increasing, but essentially you're using the same amount in circulation within the same space, essentially. And that's what we refer to as a circular economy. And one of the big obstacles to achieving that is exactly what you said. If you have a carbon taxation system or carbon pricing system in one country, what then ensures that that, uh, in that, that industry will just not be offshore, offshored and those emissions imported back into uh, into the country that's imposed the the emissions trading system, uh, and I think we are there are discussions happening on this. We are talking about it, and I think we are moving slowly towards some kind of global consensus. I think the, the this was very much being spearheaded by Europe when it when discussions around carbon border adjustment mechanisms were raised. Uh, and of course, there are concerns around, okay, is it to reduce emissions or is it a, a measure to basically bring in protectionism and make sure that industries produce goods and sell them in the countries where uh, which have those emissions trading systems. But the good thing about this is that it sparked a conversation about the need to price in carbon everywhere, uniformly across the world, across goods and services. And only when that is achieved can we sort of uh, say that that level of circularity has been achieved in some sense. Uh, but there's a way, in my view, there's a way to, there, there is some way towards getting there. Uh, I believe the G20 has very recently endorsed global carbon pricing for the very first time, which I think is a huge step. Uh, and I think, we're, so my answer would be, I think we're getting there, but it's certainly a problem that's increasingly being recognized. Uh, and I think uh, Nicola might have something to add to this as well. Yes, I fully agree with Anupama. And uh, typically when I give uh, public lectures to the general public, sometimes it happens, the typical uh, observation is that, well, uh, the emission, we are making efforts to reduce our emission in Europe, but most of the emissions come from typically China. Hmm? What, this is what they say. And uh, you have to explain them this, that this happens not only because Chinese are, are many, but also because Europe uh, shifted its industry, many industrial sectors or many, a, a substantial part of it to China and even other countries. So. We decreased our emission, but actually, well, it's it, we, we just exported it, you know? And uh, this is being discussed at the international level. For example, I was uh, kind of uh, surprised, if not shocked some time ago to find out that the international shipping is not considered in, in this uh, emission trading system. And ship, shipping is, is, a, is a terrible emitter in our planet, but since, the, 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 the ships are in international waters. This is not considered. So this is again to point out what I mentioned before during my speech is that we need international cooperation on everything. And this is an example. We have to improve this scheme because I mean, the planet is, is just one. I mean, there is no geographical border. And this is something that has to be explained very clearly but to politicians. If, if, if young people tell to politicians, maybe they understand. Thank you, Nicola and Dr. Sen, for your questions and responses, Matthias. Um, one more question that I would like to pose that was actually asked by Alvin Aditio, who's not currently here to ask it. 
was looking from the perspective of developing countries where the government's energy transition agenda from fossil fuel power plant to renewable and clean energy is rather late or even non-existent as compared to other countries from global north. What can we do as youth or citizens to ensure this transition takes place anytime soon? Um, I would like to hand over to Dr. Sen, you have the floor. I mean, I'm happy if uh, I'm happy if Rin wants to go first. I can go after Rin. <laughs> oh. Rin, if you would like, please, please go ahead. I will follow. Maybe oh, I missed yeah. the first part of the question, probably because I, I had a problem with the with the connection. The the first part of the question that you made. Yes. So looking. Can, for can you please repeat? Yeah, from the perspective of developing countries where government's agenda from fossil fuels to renewables is rather late or even non-existent compared to other countries in the global north. What can we as the youth and citizens do to ensure this transition takes place very soon? Right, so uh, I can go ahead and give some thoughts on that. Uh, so uh, this is a really excellent uh, question and it is something that often enters the research that we do. How do we account for the political economy of energy transition in countries? And the, the fact that, that there are institutional and other barriers uh, which prevents uh, the energy transition from moving ahead at speed. Um, and often there are sort of, there are two points here. One is uh, there are perhaps incumbent interests. And I think the coal industry, for instance, was mentioned where uh, politicians or decision makers may be involved in that. If you go back to the reason why they're involved in that, it could be because it allows them to provide patronage. It allows them to, let's say, promise low or cheap electricity to the voters and therefore to continue the proliferation of fossil fuels or very low price fossil fuels in certain countries. But I, I, I think that I, I don't think that will uh, that will persist this decade. I think things will change. This is because, first of all, the world is changing. And if you just look five years ago, where there were countries that were arguing that environment and economic development were in conflict, they are no longer doing that. I don't think there is any country now that basically sees the two as being in conflict with each other. Uh, the second, uh, and as these these co these these discussions happen are around cross border taxation, around international cooperation, countries will be forced to either get on board with the energy transition or risk being left behind. The other point is that a lot of this has to do with costs. So why are politicians able to provide free electricity to their electorates? It's because coal is very cheap. We're looking at a future where renewables are, as, are already cost competitive. And we're looking at a future where renewables are gonna be cheap as cheap as coal, essentially, to, to produce electricity and provide them to citizens in these countries. And so the technology itself and the economics makes these kinds of patronages very difficult to sustain in the future. Uh, an, an example from India, for instance, utilities used to prefer signing power purchase agreements uh, with the big coal companies because they could get cheap electricity from coal. But now, they are willing to sign power purchase agreements with uh, renewable developers because they know that they can get electricity at the same price. So this systemic change is occurring. It's very slow, but it's occurring because of two things. One is technology and costs. And the second is because the world is changing and because we have these international coalitions now forming. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sen. Rind. Yeah, I think um, being in a developing country sometimes can be an advantage. So I, I often use the example of uh, mailing and then online services. So in some developing countries, um, instead of moving toward from administration that can be done over the mail, like sending a document, sending your paperwork by mail, and then moving to the online procedure where you can actually do your whole document online, a lot of countries move directly from in-person to online. So I think the same could apply for the energy transition. So if you're in a country that's suffering from energy access problems, from quality or, uh, or basically the cost of energy that's too high for the inhabitants, the energy transition can allow you to just take the big leap, take the big step from an inefficient system that's often reliant on fossil fuels to a system that works and also a clean system that relies on renewable energy. 
So as Dr. Sen pointed out, the new goals are now very cost competitive, and that allows us to jump directly into systems that, that are in the, in the same line of the energy and climate fight that we're, we're doing right now. Another advantage is that we are in an age of democratization of energy because we have these decentralized and smaller scale energy production units. So we can have local initiatives. Uh, I come from, a, from Lebanon and in most parts of the country we have power cuts. So we have to rely on private generators for our electricity. So we have a country that's suffering from energy access issues, but at the same time we have initiatives like Rice 2030. It's an initiative that was in Lebanon and it's part of the Youth Sustainable Energy Hub by the SDG7 Youth Constituency, where there was actually training of women so they can deploy locally solar installations. So the problem is no longer why isn't my government investing in clean energy. It's also if I have the projects, if I have the means, why can't I be part of why can't I be the next person? Thank you. I had the opportunity to visit Lebanon before the lockdown and I was, well, it's a beautiful country. And the, the first question that came to me is why they are using oil since they are so blessed by sunlight. I mean, it's, 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 this evidence is compelling. So there is something wrong about that, clearly, you know, and, and now it's, it's affordable. Um, uh, so the problem is, is the big problem. I'm not an economist, so I just mentioned it, the problem of energy subsidies. And they are completely uh, used in, 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 in not properly by many, uh, in many countries. And that's, that is something that has to be also considered at the global level. Again, we need a global cooperation, even on this aspect, otherwise we don't do anything. And finally, uh, one thing that, that, that uh, uh, struck me when I, when I visited sub-Saharan Africa in, in remote villages, you can see that uh, they don't have uh, traditional telephone lines, but they already have the mobile. So, this is a clear evidence, this is a classical example showing that you don't need to pass through uh, the, the traditional energy system to go to renewables. You can go from wood, from uh, you know, biomass directly to, to photovoltaics without passing through traditional. And, and now you can do it and they must do it. And they are doing it in many cases, that, that's very good. Uh, thank you, Nicola. I would like to move on and ask another question. I know Ujimwe, you have your hand up. So if you would like, to answer this one first, and then I have a question as well, which is mainly directed to you. Yeah, no, I just wanted to add that two things I believe would be important, um, especially in developing countries or countries that are arguing, um, would be how we communicate um, to the people and to the policymakers or to people that need to make that decision. Um, we need to be very um, concerted with our communication efforts and be very deliberate about explaining what the impact is, what the expectations are, and even providing um, clear evidence, whether in terms of numbers or, most people just don't have this information and the communication just doesn't come out right. And the second thing is around transparency. So if you're explaining that you're moving um, subsidies, for instance, from fossil fuels, I think you have to be very transparent about what the subsidies or what any funds are going to be used for. Or if, if you're taxing carbon emissions, um, how is it going to be used? You need to give proper records and then communicate um, properly. Uh, thank you, Ujimwa. I would now like to hand over to Medwini to ask his own question. And I think we'll direct that to you, back to you, Ujimwa, as well. Thank you very much. Sorry. I don't know if it's just me, but I can't hear you. Do you mind talking close to the microphone? Can you hear me now? Uh, try again. Can you hear me now? A little bit better. All right. My question was actually what the the the, the previous presenter have not have not grasped her name. Is it Ojimena? Um, she talked about how you could engage along the value chain of renewable energy. And for us, 
in sub-Saharan Africa and particularly our country, um, we have issues that right now, right now, it's not even a question of us, the youth, being able to to operate businesses and so on. It's like the the competition, the land, the renewable energy landscape in the country, inside the country alone, is unfavorable for for such ventures because, like, the country has just started on its way to explore, to to mine oil. So it's it's very hard for the country to now prioritize prioritize renewable energy. So it makes the landscape really very tricky for the youth who even want to start on innovation in that direction. So it, it's quite a handful. Uh, and I'm, I'm appealing that you consider also the capacity, the capacity, the capacity gap among youth and, and women along in engaging to that in that value chain, especially on finances and also and also the knowledge itself, it's not very accessible. Yeah, thank you. So if I just address um, what he said, I, I think we already addressed the first point around uh, moving from fossil fuels or trying to convince governments um, about the benefits and, and where the world is moving. Um, I think just directly on the second point about having a, a more level playing field for the young people especially, um, three things I would say would be, one, I think we need to support um, project development for young people um, and even for women. Um, so project development sometimes um, requires some form of equity or some form of grants just to help them to understand what the feasibility of that project would be, um, if their business models make sense, their financial models. And today, there are a number of organizations that support with that, like the Private Financing Advisory Network. But I think we can do more, um, and maybe we should dedicate some more effort to supporting the youth around, ensuring that their projects um, are financeable and that they, they even make sense for the market they are targeting. Um, the second point is really around, um, for investors, around the disbursement process and the requirements. I think especially given where we are and the speed at which we want to move, we need to have standardized processes and documentation for projects. So if people know that if I'm coming to any financier for these types of projects, all I need is a certain list of documents and the standard agreements would, would be this. I think it will, it will speed up the process and you don't need to, for instance, um, get a lawyer or, or someone else. So I believe that this is where the donor community and financiers can come together to make it easier for the youth and even for women. And the last thing I would say is um, private public and um, public private partnerships. Um, I think government has a role to play um, in supporting young people to, to develop their projects from ideas to pro projects. For instance, in, in Lagos, Nigeria last year, um, we had um, a smart meter hackathon. So where we brought people from across the country um, to come and try to develop locally made meters using local materials as far as possible, and then handhold them through the process until they have a product um, that, is, that can be mass produced. I think that kind of support would be useful if we can find some budget for it um, to help the young people to navigate through some challenging um, project development steps. Thank you. Thank you, Ujumwa. I would now like to ask for the final question. Uh, Christian, if you're here, you have the floor. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, uh, my question was about, uh, we always put a lot of attention about the climate change and the raising temperatures or the carbon uh, emissions. Uh, but as uh, one of our professors here in uh, up north in the Sweden, Johan Rockström, has mentioned the planet boundaries. So it is not like only the climate change, the real problem. There is other things that we also need to address and uh, my question was like, uh, should we also reconsider, I mean, in this uh, decade, a change in the way that we educate the new generations uh, to be more comfortable with uh, the new challenges and to gain more, uh, I know, information about all these uh, challenges and uh, planet boundaries in general. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Uh, Nico? Yeah, this is a very important topic. I can tell you that this is strongly considered by the European Chemical Society. I am part of the board of this society and we have produced a, a periodic table of the elements, which I will, uh, I will send you later or show you, uh, in which every element is uh, 
not all the elements are the same in terms of size in the table, but they are uh, their size depend on the relative abundance on the on, on the planet. And about this, we are organizing next year a, a seminar, a webinar on nitrogen and and, uh, and and phosphorus, because these two elements are exactly what you mentioned. They are uh, we are beyond the 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 the, 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 the um, the planet boundaries in terms of nitrogen cycle and phosphorus cycle because we have taken them too many from the atmosphere, the nitrogen and from the rocks, phosphorus, and we have put it in the environment. We use it in agriculture because of making fertilizers and they, they are collected in the, in, in, the, in the rivers and they go straight away to the seaside and they generate a big problem. And we are already, we have already uh, overtaken this limit. So, I, I will uh, uh, submit, uh, if you follow me on LinkedIn or Facebook, I will continue to update on this topic and you will have scientific uh, uh, um, information on that through myself via the European Chemical Society. Uh, thank you, Nicola. Before closing off, I would like to give perhaps the floor to Rind or Kabir, because this I think this question is directly linked to either the education and research from RIND, but also the funding and opportunities for Kabir. So any one of you. I'll quickly pick the floor and then leave some time if Kabir would like to add something. Uh, I'm actually going to start with something that Kabir mentioned because he was the one that talked about the university employment gap. And this is something that we were seeing in Christian's question that the things that we're learning, if we are learning something about the energy transition, aren't really complete or appropriate or adapted to the energy transition we're facing. So either they're simply not there or they're missing some different perspectives. And we have this only CO2 based uh, vision of the energy transition, while what we're actually looking for is something that is more interdisciplinary. When, when we tackle a problem, I'm sure that Dr. Sen can agree that uh, tackling the, the energy transition from a purely technical perspective wouldn't be sufficient. We also have to look like at economic, social aspects, at resources, not just looking at energy as kilowatt hours. So um, another another point that's, that's linked to this, when we want to look at the planetary boundaries, we have to also support initiatives that take this interdisciplinary approach into account. So with the SG7 Youth Constituency, we have initiatives taking place around the world, like an initiative in South America, the Latin American Observatory of uh, Energy Geopolitics. So I think that issues like that, like uh, the limits on materials or the limits that are linked to social aspects, should be explored. There are already some initiatives that are growing, but we also need more support and more recognition to these interdisciplinary approaches to energy. Yeah, and um, what I would add to that is, um, you know, beyond beyond the planetary boundaries, I think your question was also about how we educate people about uh, new topics. And I think um, for myself, um, you know, I've been learning about planetary boundaries very recently, completely outside of school. Um, and I think a lot of people kind of within the energy space, um, and, and Rin kind of mentioned this as well, um, as a researcher and as a, as a youth researcher, I think um, we are constantly learning and there are so many opportunities to learn constantly. And, and that's another way in which I think the world is evolving in that, um, you know, our education doesn't really end once we graduate. We are, we really are lifelong learners. Um, and I think um, education through experience and through practice and, and project management and so on is equally important compared to um, what we learn in school. And um, I, I, I'm really excited that, you know, Student Energy um, and, and a lot of other organizations, I think, nowadays uh, recognize that and kind of recognize the importance of interdisciplinarity um, and, uh, you know, lifelong learning and, and realize that young people are or curious people in general, not even if they're young, um, like as long as you have curiosity and you care about something, you can really make a difference in the world. Um, and that's kind of all part of the learning process. So, um, yeah, that was a really good question, Christian. 
Um, thank you, um, everyone, for answering the questions. This marks the end of our Q&A. And I would now like to conclude quickly by summarizing the fourth edition of the Irene Youth Talk. We've discussed a wide range of solutions, including the accessibility and inclusivity of renewable energy technology, and how such a macroeconomic change actually starts with the individual consumer. We are actually the catalyst to this important energy transition. Renewables are going to revolutionize the way in which we live our day-to-day -day lives. They will also stimulate our economies and societies and promote greater progression. And today's marks not only the start of a long, but also enriching journey in which we, the youth, are leading by example. So before ending this webinar, I would like to take a moment to thank all of our panelists and speakers today for such insightful messages. Your experience and reflections really do demonstrate how truly important renewables are and inspire greater change. I would also like to thank the audience who have been so actively engaged. Your questions are showing the hope of a brighter future. It has been an honor to be your moderator and be front and center of such a stimulating discussion. Therefore, I would now like to draw your attention to the next youth talk of the energy transition series, which is bound to be in mid-September. So stay tuned and thank you everyone.